Hello everyone, it's me again. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I've had uh, some really lovely response to my previous videos that I did uh, noodling around on my laptop. And uh, so I thought I'd share another little video. Uh, the most recent video I did, I went through my workflow um, and how I have my laptop set up. And uh, it, um, it garnered quite a lot of uh, nice response and uh, Joe Collins made a, a similar video with a bit of a retrospective on his uh, his take on uh, on Linux. So it was really um, that was really nice to see. Um, today we're doing something slightly different. Uh, I've got this is my my main laptop, uh, so it's not the X220 this time that I often use on this channel. This is my T450 ThinkPad, which is my main workhorse. In fact, I'll show you a picture of it here. Uh, so this is the T450. Uh, it's got a Core i7 processor. I've upgraded it to 32 gig of RAM, and it's got two SSDs in it. Uh, one's a traditional size, like a normal hard drive, and the other one is an M2 drive. Um, and the one terabyte main drive is running Ubuntu, um, and it usually sits in this docking station here. So you can see the bulk out to the left-hand side. That's part of the docking station that's underneath it. Uh, and I use that so that I can have it easily attached to these two displays. So I have all three displays running at once and I have different stuff on each one. The main focus being whatever's on the laptop. But I often pop the laptop out of the docking station and just shut the lid and then go for a drive and end up in a different office or something and just open up my laptop and carry on working. So um, I, I, I like not having to restart all my applications and not having to reboot the laptop. I quite like a high uptime. Um, so yeah, don't bother commenting about the mess my desktop is in. <laughs> I appreciate my desktop is a slightly messy environment. I get that. Um, and for those people looking out, this is a ThinkPad X61S and this is a BQ M10 tablet. Um, anything else interesting on this desk? Uh, this is a Nexus 7. Um, and there's my mug of coffee here. Uh, so yeah, that's my environment. And I've been running Ubuntu on this laptop, the current install for a while now. Uh, it was originally installed um, two years ago. So I did this install using a KDE Neon ISO. I actually did it on a plane at 30,000 feet, uh, disconnected from the internet because why not? Um, and I did a clean install, and it was 16.04 Xenial um, back in 2018. And I did this because I wanted to try out Plasma. And so I tried out Plasma, and I used it for about 18 months, really enjoyed it. It's a lovely alternative to uh, GNOME, highly configurable, really fast. It's really great. I have nothing but good words to say about the KDE team and uh, everything in Plasma. It's just brilliant. Um, but... As I work for Canonical and we have a big LTS release coming up, I figured it would be a good idea if I switch back to using our stock experience so that I could test it, file bugs and all that good stuff and give feedback and, and, uh, and all that stuff. So I have switched back to GNOME for the last six months or so, um, but this is still that install uh, and I kind of want to start again. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It's getting a bit crafty. There is a whole load of stuff on this system. Um, I've built up um, a lot of stuff in my home directory. I've built up a lot of applications that are installed, some of which I don't really need. It's a bit of a mess. Um, so that's partly why I want to do a reinstall. And the other reason I want to do a reinstall is because I want to try out this ZFS or ZFS stuff. And you can only really do that with a clean install. Uh, my system is EXT4, I think. Um, but I'd really like to uh, install using ZFS and um, use the new features that, that that provides. So those are the reasons why I want to do it. Um, and the way I'm going to do it is I've downloaded a copy of um, Ubuntu 2004, and I went via the links on the Ubuntu ISO tracker. So if you go to iso.qa.ubuntu.com, there are links on that page. Uh, alternatively, you can use... Um, the directly to the server CD image. You'll find the uh, images on cdimage.ubuntu.com under daily live. And the image I've used is this one here, uh, which is the image for 2004 daily build. And today it's the 1st of March. So this is the one I've chosen to use today. Um, 
I've put that on a USB stick, which if I plug that into my laptop, hopefully it will mount that and you'll see it's just a, a typical um, USB stick where I've just copied the contents onto uh, onto it. Um, there we go. So yeah, it's just a 2004 AMD 64 install USB stick. Actually, I've also, I can show you um, in disks. There's the one terabyte disk I'm going to install onto. It's a Samsung 860 Evo. Um, and it's currently got a fat partition and the EXT4 and then swap down the end. But I'm just going to nuke that completely and put ZFS on it. The other disk that's in here is an M2 drive, and that's got Windows on it. I only really use that for doing firmware updates and for um, testing out some of the software that we make available for Windows. So Snapcraft and Multipass and WSL, that kind of stuff I test out on Windows, but I almost never boot into it. Um, I I tend to just use uh, Linux on the most part. In fact, um, if, you, uh, if you look at this, if I run uh, up records, you can see that I have, you know, decent uptime on this laptop because what I tend to do is leave it running and then when I walk away from my desk I pop the laptop out of the docking station slam the lid shut and then go off somewhere else maybe into the office or just downstairs sit on the sofa open the laptop up and so I accumulate these yeah. these decent uh uptimes in fact the highest uptime 29 days was back when I first installed it back in February 2018 so that's the highest uptime I achieved so far and that was under KDE Neon. So that's a good, you know, ringing endorsement for KDE Neon. Um, so that's good. Uh, yeah, don't at me about uh, not rebooting my system. I use Canonical Live Patch to ensure my kernel is up to date. Um, so I'm going to reboot. And after I've rebooted uh, onto the USB stick, we'll do a completely clean install. Now, I have already backed up this system. Obviously, I would recommend if you're a novice, you don't run pre-release versions of Ubuntu. This is not out yet, as I make this. It's not out for another month and a half or so. Um, and also, back up your data. Now, I'm not the kind of person who has a separate home partition, and I don't reinstall the OS very often. As you can see, this was reinstalled, last installed two years ago. Um, but I know some people do do that, but that's just not my my thing. Anyway, let's restart and actually start this um, this install. So I'm going to reboot into the USB key. Um, apologies for any flickering and uh, weird stuff. I'm capturing the output of my laptop using a Majorwell HDMI capture card, and that's running through another computer that's running OBS to record the screen. So that's how I'm recording this. So hopefully I'll see the ThinkPad logo. There we go. Press Enter because I want to override the boot device. I use the startup menu to press F12 and it shows me all the boot devices that I can pick from. The one I want is the Kingston USB stick. Now it freaks out a little bit just here. Hmm. So I'm going to go try Ubuntu. I could just go straight for the install Ubuntu but I just want to noodle around the desktop first. Um, yeah, apologies for the flicker. Now this is something new. Uh, we've had a media checker, I think, on the, on the ISO for a long time, but we're now running it by default. In fact, I have a feeling we used to run this by default many years ago, but it's been decided that uh, we're going to run it by default. You can skip it, as you can see, press S to skip down the bottom, but I'm not going to skip it because I want to make sure that all the files on the USB stick are sane before I do the install. I know some other... Some other distros do this actually. I think Fedora does this, has some kind of sanity check before it boots. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I'm pretty sure Fedora does this. So it should boot to the desktop, um, and then I should be able to do the install. Nearly there. Great. <laughs> now, uh, I just need to press a couple of buttons because it's currently uh, spreading the desktop across two displays, but what I want to do mirror the internal and external panel. So you're now seeing um, my internal panel as well. Now, this is a thing that some people really hate. It is the crash report tool, affectionately called Whoopsie. Uh, and the 
uh, whoopsie, it has detected that there is a problem with my system, which is good. You know, it's good to detect these things uh, before release. Um, and you can hit the details button if you're so inclined to find out what it was that crashed because something crashed, right? And I can say, send this crash report to Canonical, but it says, actually, I already know about this. And so you don't need to send this, which is great. Somebody else has already reported it. And when you hit close, in theory, it should open a web browser up. It might take a little while because it's doing the crash reporting in the background. And another crash report has appeared for a similar related thing, but not exactly the same. And I could say remember and just send. This is like the minimum effort required to contribute to Ubuntu is to just send those crash reports because then... Uh, developers can look at these and then determine what the the resolution is now i've already looked through this and there's a bit of a conversation here about it and then there's a link from uh, ian lane who works on the uh, the desktop team has found that there is an upstream bug and then there's a conversation in the upstream bug i don't think i need to do anything here there's there's conversations here between all the relevant parties and i don't think i can add any value so even though the dialogue box that popped up said you know, put some more information in here. I don't think there's any value add I can do here because other people have already said me too. Now, what I could do is log into Launchpad up here using my Ubuntu SSO account, and I could there's a little button that appears here that says affects me, and I could click that and say this affects me. Uh, but I think enough people have got eyeballs on this that I don't need to worry about that. In fact, it's even got a duplicate bug uh, over here. So you know, happens on startup. This was reported last week so yeah so the uh the thing has figured out that it's a duplicate so i don't need to worry about that so uh let's start the install uh, i'm pretty confident my backup has worked uh so i'm going to start the install <laughs> that's new uh uh we've got a sound effect when the uh installer starts that's rather cute in fact that is a tune that comes from Ubuntu phone I think so I'm in the UK so I'm gonna use a UK keyboard uh, now I'm gonna do a minimal install because uh, I'm gonna pick and choose what I want installed on the system I'm not gonna to choose to download updates because I'll do those afterwards anyway and I am gonna to choose to install third-party software so all the non free stuff that makes everything work I'm gonna just add that Interestingly, there is another tick box that doesn't show up here and only shows up on systems that, ha that are detected as ha needing a special kernel. So this is a new feature and not everyone is going to see it uh, because my laptop works with the stock kernel. But I think it's going to land soon. Uh, Ubiquity can tell if you're on a system that needs a special kernel and will actually offer you the option of installing that kernel because there are different Linux kernels in the Ubuntu archive for supporting uh, OEM devices. And this can detect if you're running a particular model of laptop from a particular manufacturer by querying the, you know, the internal serial number or whatever, and then say, ah, you need this other kernel and we'll offer you that, which will make 2004 much more easy to install on a wide range of devices that need bespoke kernels that's super good news but i don't see it because i have a pretty generic laptop from about five years ago right what's next get partitioning next so it's querying all the disks in my system all both of them and it should present me with options for how I want to partition them. Yes. So I can either just erase and reinstall over the top, and that will continue to use the default part partitioning scheme, which I think uses ext4. But actually, this is what I want to do. Erase the disk and use advanced features. Check me out. And I'm going to use experimental ZFS. Now, it is experimental, but I'm going to trust my colleagues and the ZFS developers, and uh, I also have backups. So I think I'm gonna be all right, but I'm gonna use this experimental because that was the whole purpose of me doing this install. Hit continue. Okay, now it's asking me which drive I want to install onto. And remember I had two drives, a one terabyte SSD and the other one that's got Windows on it. So I'm just gonna install on the one terabyte drive. 
and it says this entire disk will be used three partitions will be deleted and use the advanced partitioning tool which is basically gparted if you want more control that basically means if you want to have a separate home partition or you want to carve the disk up in a weird and interesting way use gparted then come back in here and do the install uh, and do it manually do the manual install so hit install now so it tells me here it's going to do all kinds of nonsense to my uh, my drive if i hit continue now i get to move on to the time zone and create a user uh, oh no um i forgot what now i need to think of a host name oh my gosh uh so usually my computer this is the hardest part of this whole process usually my computers are named after computers from science fiction uh like uh, you know whopper from war games or mother from uh, the alien films which is the computer uh i'm gonna go with shirker uh it's lying there's no doing that that work uh Shirker is the name of the computer in a cartoon series from the 1980s called Ulysses 31. And Shirker was the onboard computer in his ship, uh, Ulysses' ship. So, yeah, I'm going to call this Shirker. Continue. It was previously called Kinkpad K480. And the reason for that was when I was on the plane and I was installing KDE Neon on this laptop, I thought, uh it's a thinkpad running kde and i didn't have to hand my list of computers from science fiction because i was you know on a plane with no internet access so i was not very inventive and instead of calling it thinkpad i called it kinkpad k480 for some reason and people find this hugely amusing when they see screenshots or videos from my laptop this will make it much more boring using a computer from ulysses 31 which was one of my favorite uh, cartoons when i was a kid uh, it's really cool so this is going to go through the install now uh, it shouldn't take too long um, while the install is running uh, we can have a noodle around uh, one thing I've noticed is the, um, the install is using a new icon uh, which is really cute I really like this icon it's like kind of got the dots flying onto the logo as if to imply that we're installing you know we're gathering bits together to make the ubuntu install i really really like that um and we've got the new uh icons and the new theme um i wonder if the switcher is in yet this i do not like but i don't know if this is final or not because i'm installing this while we're part way through the new version of gnome landing in the archive so it's entirely possible some of this may change i don't know um, so yeah, everything may change. We just don't know. Uh, no, it doesn't look like the appearance thing is on the ISO yet. Uh, so that's not not available. So I can't change the theme in here. But that's okay, because it will land at some point soon. Uh, so we've got the new theme. Uh, in theory, it's doing the... Uh, oh, crikey, it's already done. Um, looks like it's finished writing to disk, and it's now doing the... Um, writing grub and then it removes a bunch of packages that you no longer need so the way the install works in ubuntu is you you boot if i show you the disk uh i'll just i'm just spending a bit of time talking while this is happening so there's my one terabyte disk we're installing onto there's my 256 gigabyte windows disk there's the eight gigabyte usb drive that i just booted off of and then this is the environment that i'm currently in this environment you see here is this loopback device called filesystem.squashfs it's a compressed squashfs file which is on the 8 gig drive so it's in there there's a file and uh it, that's mounted under cd-rom casper and that's got all of this stuff in it and the installer and everything and that gets splatted onto the drive and then they remove any of the bits that make up the installer because you no longer need the installer on the drive because you've done the install. I think that makes sense anyway. Um, so what have we got over here? Libreoffice, Rhythmbox, Thunderbird, 
Firefox. All good. I suspect LibreOffice won't be there because I chose the minimal install. Yes, I can see it removing stuff. It's removing LibreOffice. Um, I think in the future, this installer will change uh, because right now it's a little bit inefficient to put the files on the disk and then remove all the packages. Um, the installer would be done by now if it weren't for doing this. So I can I can kind of see an argument for rejigging the installer, but the installer is is one of those fundamental things that you don't change very often because there's so much that it does that replacing it is uh, is quite difficult because it does stuff like OEM installs and you know it can do encrypted installs and it can do ZFS and so many other things. So maybe it's a a thing for the release after LTS. Uh, maybe by the next LTS in 2204, maybe we'll have a different installer by then. Um, some of these slides have been changed, I notice. Uh, I think uh, Martin on the desktop team updated some of these recently. Um, oh, well, there we go. It's finished now. <laughs> Don't need to go through those. So we're done. I've finished the install. That didn't take long at all. Um, how long has this thing been up? So 12 minutes with me waffling about some stuff. Less than 15 minutes to do an install. I like that. So we shall restart now. And in theory, if I yank the USB drive out, I should be able to reboot into my final install, which uses ZFS. Let's find out. Hmm. It's going to work. I actually think I pulled that USB drive out too early. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. User error. Uh-oh. I wonder what it's doing. What is it doing? Oh, please remove the installation medium, then press reboot. So there's a bug right away. It didn't show me that until I did uh, control out. You, you may not be able to read that. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm now going to reboot. I'm just holding down the power button to shut it down. Right, that's that. Let's turn it back on again. And hopefully it will boot normally to Ubuntu. Oh, look at that. So we get the grub menu because uh, we've got uh, dual boot effectively. Uh, this menu wouldn't appear if I didn't have Windows. I think it would just boot straight into, uh, into Ubuntu. Okay. what that ACPI error is all about. It looks like... Hmm. No idea. Some kind of kernel thing. Okay, I've got the mouse. I've got the logon screen. You can't see that because it's on the other display, unfortunately, and I can't make it appear on the external display. No, I can't. Look. So I'm just going to type my password in. Log in, and then once I'm logged in, I'll switch the displays so you can see what I can see. There we go, done. So if I uh, switch to mirrored, you should be able to see. There we go. Uh, and behind here, sneakily behind here is, uh, hello, why can't I grab hold of that? sneakily is this little thing is it the same thing yes so i'm just gonna say remember this in future don't send because they've already had that report i'm sure that'll get fixed shortly so this is the online accounts weirdly you can't move this window that's kind of annoying uh i'm gonna skip most of this i'll set live patch up later uh yeah but i'll send that report what does it look like yeah it's basically you've got an nvidia what gpu what resolution the screen is and so on and so on. Next, uh, I'm not using location services for anything. I don't need to install any software right now. Done. My install is done. And uh, that's it. So I'm now on ZF um, uh, 2004 on ZFS. And uh, unsurprisingly, there are updates already waiting for me. So I'll install those and then I'll get to work actually using my system, uh, which we'll probably cover in another video another time thanks for watching everyone if you've got any questions leave a comment uh, you could probably get hold of me somehow online uh, but um, yeah hopefully this uh, will all work out well feel free to try out uh, 
2004, uh, either in a VM or on a real system. Uh, it's uh, pretty robust. I've got it on four of my systems here. Uh, obviously, I've done a clean install on this one, as you've seen, but um, it's been pretty robust for me. <laughs> Old crash dialogue aside, uh, so uh, maybe it will be for you. Obviously, it's not released yet, so not production stability. Uh, but if you're an adventurous type and you've got a spare laptop, I strongly recommend trying it out and uh, maybe filing bugs if you discover them, uh, letting us know where things don't work. All right. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a great rest of your day.